This is the 966 episode 58. Mr. Richard Wilson, how are you doing, sir? I'm great, Mr. Lucian Ziegler. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you for asking. Richard, family's great. Everybody's family's happy. great. How's your family? How's everything going? They're doing great. Just dropped off the, you know, the, the, the number three at school. And I'm hoping we might get a visit from Coco this, this episode, maybe. Well, um, it's funny you mention it because I've already tried to edit some out and I'll try to keep her out of it. But she has some good points to make on the PIFs investments this week. So uh, we'll let her chime in. Maybe um, we, we do have a good one this week. Uh, Richard, we have Deputy Minister of Investment Saad Al-Shahrani joining us in just a few minutes. It's a really good conversation, really, really good talk with Saad, Dr. Saad. We have a new IMF report that came out this week, which is absolutely good news for Saudi Arabia and also with a PIF has been investing in uh, in the last quarter of this year. Before we get started, Richard, the traditional preamble here, please subscribe to us wherever you're getting the, uh, the episode. If you're watching us on YouTube, please do it there or any of the podcasting platforms that we're on. Uh, we're on 26 now, Richard. I looked right before we did this. So 26. that's really good. Yeah, that's it's pretty cool. So wherever you are getting your podcast, it's very likely that we're there. So hit the subscribe button. Richard, let's get going. What you want to yes. thing this week? Just search the 966 and you'll find it everywhere. Yep. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> My one big thing, um, the International Monetary Fund, IMF, recently concluded its Article 4 consultations with Saudi Arabia. So which I actually chose this one big thing, not only for the newsy element, but to also force myself to do a little research on IMF consultations. As viewers may have noticed, every now and then I'll take on a, a, a topic <laughs> simply because I don't know much about it and I'd like to learn more, so I'm forcing myself. So first, the newsy part. Good news, exclamation point for Saudi Arabia. The report concludes that Saudi Arabia is growing at the fastest rate in a decade, is likely to lead global economies with GDP growth of 7.6% projected for 2022. Some key findings from the from the report, uh, despite higher prices uh, across the board, inflation ro ro will remain contained at 2.8%. Uh, public finances and external position will strengthen substantially uh, thanks to increased non-oil revenue and higher proceeds from oil expor exports. Uh, IMF envisions a budget surplus of 5.5% of GDP this year. Saudi Arabia is taking impressive steps to improve the business environment, attract foreign investment, and create private sector employment. <clears throat> um, these initiatives, combined with governance, labor market reform, uh, have made it easier to do business, increase the number of industrial facilities, and raised female participation in the labor force. Um, growing digi digitalization has the potential to boost productivity given a young population. Uh, digit digitalization accelerated during the pandemic. And you think that was an Ar Arabic name. I'm, I'm struggling with <laughs> digitalization. Accelerated during the pandemic, including through, an through, including through an online health services, virtual courts, distance learning, and an online finance platform for public uh, procurement known as Etimad. The report's conclusion is that, quote, Saudi Arabia's economic outlook is strong. Maintaining the kingdom's long-term prosperity depends crucially on sustaining the reform momentum. So they love, they love what Saudi Arabia is doing. Um, this is, this is, so it's a really good positive report almost across the board. Now, quickly to the short research part, and, and this may be of interest because, you know, Article 4 consultations are everywhere. So basically, there are 190 member countries in the IMF. Saudi Arabia joined in 1957. Oh, that's was way that, longer ago your, than I thought. No, was I was going to say 56. I thought you might guess. <laughs> no, <laughs> I purposefully did not guess so, so as not to be decades off. <laughs> it shows your good judgment. When you, when you join AMF, you agree to what is termed country surveillance, and that includes regular, usually annual, comprehensive consultations. These are mandated by Article 4 of the IMF's Articles of Agreement, hence Article 4 consultations. Now, during an Article 4 consultation, an IMF team of economists visits a country to assess economic and financial developments and discuss the country's economic and financial policies with government and central bank officials. IMF staff missions also often meet with parliamentarians and representatives of business and civil society. Um, and this is not just, you know, they don't fly in and fly out. They come in and set up shop and they stay there for a little bit. 
So this cycle of meetings in Saudi Arabia was completed on June 7th with the report just now published. Um, for reference, you know, U.S. is a member of IMF. They get one every year, too. It's like, it's like an exam. Um, this year's article for consultations for the U.S. was published July 12th. Um, if you want to read some of the analysis, I recommend the IMF's, quote, Saudi Arabia Selected Issues publication. That can be downloaded at... I'll send you the link, Lucian. IMF.org. It should be... I think we got it right this time, even though I'm wearing my headphones on the wrong ear. So I should be, <laughs> I just noticed that, but it should be there. Anyway, right. it's so, right there. All right. Yeah, look there. <laughs> anyway, so I'll get that to you. So a little background on our article for consultations, your comprehensive economic and financial checkup courtesy of the IMF. Nice. So it's like a doctor coming into the country and being like, hey, how's your economy doing? <laughs> I had some analogies, but they're inappropriate for radio. <laughs> <laughs> um <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that that is it's the one big thing this week, Richard, because when that report came out, it was sort of it was headline grabbing. I mean, it was the Saudi Arabia has a very good shot at being the fastest growing economy in the world this year. And obviously it's because of oil prices, but there is a lot of good information in there and positive data for Saudi Arabia on non oil GDP and non oil GDP growth. It really is just bucking glo the global trend on um, you know, there's a sort of a global economic recession or maybe just like a slowdown. It's kind of hard to say at this point. But what the IMF is saying is that Saudi Arabia is heading in literally the opposite direction. It's also interesting too, Richard, that this report, um, the IMF sort of gives advice, sort of like a doctor might. You, you either follow it or you don't. It but does, um, it does. the IMF said that Saudi Arabia should resume letting domestic energy prices rise as part of efforts to reduce consumption and in help uh, and help, excuse me, in hitting reduction targets for emissions. Uh, you know, and then Saudi Arabia says, well, OK, that's you know, pretty good advice. We may or may not do that. Uh, we do have energy price caps and, you know, they're there for partially political reasons, partially economic reasons. But yeah, no, I mean, this is and, and we're going to have all the um, right there. We'll have all of the sort of graphs and different stuff that the IMF put out right there um, <laughs> um, for the YouTube viewers. But yeah, this report was big news for Saudi Arabia. I mean, really good news for Saudi Arabia. Well, it's nice because it's, it's an impartial source and it's an in-depth, comprehensive, you know, examination done by, you know, economists and, and, and people who are, are trained to do exactly what they're doing in terms of these economic and financial forensics. So it's, you know, you can look at it and, and, and have some confidence in its, its conclusions and its conclusions are, you know, extremely positive. And they do go out of their way to say that, you know, much of what's been put in place, the direction is is a, a positive and promising, and uh, they encourage obviously that this this trend and trajectory continues. And they also always throw in, and I always like to see it thrown in. You know, they they encourage you know continued fiscal responsibility, which which the government Saudi mm -hmm. government has shown. Um, so a glowing report, really. It's it's funny, Richard, because we have this show is really economics focus, trade, commerce, you know, we do a lot of stuff. I mean, we had a really great interview with Ahmed Shali last week um, that was, you know, on the Saudi music scene. But, you know, we of, of the 57 guests, more than that now, because we've had a couple episodes with multiple guests. Um, it's like a large, it's got to be, and we should go back and do this, but it's got to be a large percentage of them have had at least some experience working at the IMF. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, uh, you know, it's just, I'm just sort of thinking like that usually comes up in my readout, like, oh, and did a stint at the IMF and, and you're like, oh, well, that, that's, uh, well, so it's, it, it is a global organization. You know, to that point, Dr. Saad al-Sharani, who our guest this mm -hmm. week, we were talking about his background and it's, and it's an incredible background, but he spoke specifically about how, uh, valuable his, his time as an economist at IMF. He spent five years there, um, I believe four or five years. He said it was just a tremendous learning experience and that uh, it was something he had always aspired to, to be an economist in IMF. And he's gone on to even even greater things. But yeah, to your point, there you go. It seems to be at the nexus of a lot of people's uh, careers and, and journeys. Mm -hmm. And speaking of which, our very first guest on the 966, who will always be on a pantheon, you know, on a Indeed. platform of his own. Abdullah Hassan. Uh, Ab Abdullah Hassan, you know, uh, at the IMF. So... Yep. Yes. Richard, my one big thing, and that was really good. So, but it's probably the second big thing. I mean, that's the one big thing. My one big thing this week, Richard, 
It's a big thing. It's a pretty big thing. Um, Four times a year, we get to look at the SEC 13F filing form uh, from Saudi Arabia's Public Investment Fund, which is a quarterly report required to be filled out by all institutional investment managers with at least $100 million in assets under management. And with a PIF hey, having have, about... Have, sorry to interrupt. Have you filed yours yet? I didn't. Um, damn. Hey, can we damn. pause I this? That. Yeah. I miss that. They don't like that. So, you know, <laughs> so folks like us with $100 million under asset under management. <laughs> well, it's funny because uh, the PIF definitely has to because they have now $620 billion in assets. So they're way above that threshold. Um, anyway, they do it four times a year. Whenever this report becomes public, it gets picked up by news outlets because it reflects what the PIF is doing in terms of investments. And this week, Richard, we got to look at what they're doing. And they haven't exactly been sitting on their hands in the second quarter. The PIF snatched up stakes in Alphabet, Zoom video. So they now own part of this conversation, Richard. Um, Microsoft, as part of a wider pick of U.S. stocks, it brings the PIF's portfolio value to about $40.8 billion. Uh, that's the, at the end of the second quarter. The PIF also added to positions it held in Facebook, owner of Meta Platforms, PayPal Holdings, Electronic Arts. Richard, I'm not done. 6.3 million <laughs> shares in Starbucks. Uh, added another added other stocks, including Adobe Systems, Advanced Micro Devices, Salesforce, Home Depot, Costco, Datadog, NextEra <clears throat> Energy. So that oil money was burning a hole in their pocket, Richard, and uh, it looks like they really did go on a, a pretty significant buying spree. What's really interesting, I think, to both of us, Richard, and we've talked about this, is this is sort of now the second time they've followed this playbook. Um, there's been a pretty solid drop in markets this year. I mean, year to date, Dow Jones is down about 6%, S&P down 10%, the NASDAQ is down almost 17%. So for the PIF, it's sort of buy low, sell high. Um, during the pandemic, the PIF decided to go long and snatched up some battered stocks right as the pandemic was hitting hard. They were in areas like travel and tourism and also maybe no, most notably in live entertainment. And just one example is the PIF's acquisition of concert and event org- organizer Live Nation, uh, which hit low prices during the pandemic shutdown. Of course, nobody saw going back to live shows uh, again, but the PIF did see that. They put down about $500 million uh, to acquire uh, Live Nation shock, Live Nation stock, excuse me, at about 40 bucks a share. Today, Live Nation is trading right around 100 bucks a share. So cool way to make half a billion dollars or more. Uh, the PIF also invested in Carnival Cruises, which bounced up and is back down again. But um, they've really been active at investing globally, you know, build wealth and expand its portfolio. And I, Richard, I just wanted to sort of wrap up with this thought. You know, obviously, we both remember when Vision 2030 was announced, there was so much happening all at once. There were like major reforms, economic and social. There was a new way of governments. There were new faces in the government. It was such a huge deal. And it was that was sort of part of it was it was just like so um, it was just so huge. Um, The announcement that they'd make the PIF, which, as you know, had been sitting around since the 70s, but was sort of collecting dust as an organization into one of the largest sovereign wealth funds in the world was just one of those things that was announced and it was so ambitious. It was hard to know if any of it would actually happen. Um, but just to sort of get to my point here, the resuscitation of the PIF, hiring a bunch of really smart people, both Saudi and non-Saudi, and then turning it into a huge sovereign wealth fund that then invested the kingdom's money has turned out to be really a good move, a really profitable move. One of the smartest moves they've made. Um, one of the biggest major decisions in the kingdom has taken in its history. So, I mean, Right now, that looks like a really, really smart move to create the PIF, and they're just getting started. Uh, agreed. It, you know, and and you never know with markets, uh, but it is interesting to watch them. You, you referenced the the foray into markets in the beginning of the pandemic, where it's very much buy low, sell high, or just buy low and hold on. Uh, a, a little bit of the same thing here, because seventeen, you know, seventeen minority stakes, you know, basically minority stakes in seventeen companies. The, the fact of the matter is that their portfolio, PIS portfolio, that 40.8 billion that you mentioned is down 3 billion um, in the quarter. And that's simply because of all, you know, the US market, stock market is down. Um, you know, but you, you, you don't want to look at it quarterly like that. And I'm sure a, a large you know, sovereign wealth fund that looks long-term, but it is great to see them being opportunistic. And, and like you say, you referred to it as dusty and, you know, so, um, it, it was switched over to the PIF in 2015, 
you know, the, the, the previous sovereign wealth fund, which had, was very conservative and not very active. Um, and the PAF has been much more aggressive and, and they very aggressive in specific areas. You know, they like gaming, they like futuristic stocks and you, you know, the list you ran, you know, uh, Alphabet, uh, Microsoft, Meta, uh, the game, video game developer, Take Two Interactive, Uber on Walmart, but uh, Uber, and, you know, these are all technological, technologically advanced companies. And, and that's where they, the space they occupy. So it's just really interesting to watch. I, I, I always, I'm always reluctant to sort of take an accounting and make a judgment at a point in time because you really have to do it over the long term. But they certainly seem to be looking for opportunities and, and extraordinarily active. And you and I have talked about, you know, what is PIF, you know, because it's such an interesting entity. I refer to it as a unicorn because it's, you know, it's active domestically too, as well as internationally. So this is interesting. And it's nice to see them, uh, you know, active in the U.S. markets. The UAE this quarter and Saudi Arabia also um picked up after a sort of a long, slow, steady decline, their activity in, in the in U.S. Uh, debt in the buying, uh, you know, in the Federal mm -hmm. Reserve and buying um, U.S. debt, which had been declining. It, they, they bought a little more debt this quarter, too. So Saudi Arabia is looking for opportunities and they have the, you know, they, they're flush right now. So they have the opportunity to have the, have the means to look for opportunities. Yeah, and they've made some bad investments. The Uber investment wasn't a great investment. I mean, they, they've, they've, you know, like every investor, you have wins and you have losses. Um, and soft, yeah, sorry, soft yeah, bank. Soft no, bank. No, no, yeah, yeah, Soft Bank's had, another had a hard quarter. And, you know, a lot of people have had a hard quarter. But then that's why that's what we were talking about. You know, that's why you, you know you're just looking over the long trend, see see how it goes. But it certainly makes sense to be doing what they're doing, which you reference, is to you know buying low and and looking for opportunities when the market's depressed. Mm -hmm. Yep. Richard, let's get to our awesome conversation with Dr. Saad Al Shahrani, Deputy Minister of Investment. Brilliant guy. Great conversation. Really wonderful. And and we it's a treat and we're honored that uh, Dr. Saad joined us. It uh, you know, the Ministry of Investment is right at the heart of so much of what's going on in terms of the national investment strategy or the Vision 2030. It was a great opportunity to get uh, get some some insight from him who's you know right there at, at the core of what's going on with misa enjoy joining us now on the 966 dr saad al shahrani dr saad is deputy minister for economic affairs and investment studies at the ministry of investment board member at king abdullah city for atomic and renewable energy and has served with the central bank imf dr saad thank you so much for joining us on the 966 Thank you very much, and I'm really happy to have you uh, with me in this discussion and have me also in this podcast. Yeah, we're delighted you could join us on the 966. And actually, I'd like to add a few items to Lucian's introduction regarding your, as your resume, because it's really impressive. And he mentioned you know, you, you, you're on the board of directors with KCARE. You're also a fellow professor of economics at Princess Nora, uh, Bint Abdul Rahman University, the largest uh, university for females in the world. But you've been at key spots throughout. You were at the Ministry of Finance for five years, Islamic Development Bank, four years, Economist at IMF, uh, eight years at SAMA. Um, and also, you, you know, during key periods, you were in important positions at the, at the Saudi Geological Survey, which is interesting because, you know, that survey that, that they have done is, is really key for the mineral industry. And you were with also the Council of Economic and Development Affairs, which is sort of the, the, the fundamentally important governing body for economic changes. But I want to compliment you, Dr. Saad, because on your resume, which is extraordinary, you included your first job out of college, I think, when you were assistant financial accountant for the, at the food supermarket. And I, I, I love it when people do this. And I, I think I may show this to my two younger kids about, about you know, You've got to start somewhere. You know, if you want to achieve great things, you have to start somewhere. So I want to thank you for including your very first job out of college. You're welcome. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, can we talk about the Saudi economy a little bit? And, and as you well know, uh, we well we talk about the, the economy a lot on the 966, and, and, and understandably so. But 
this year, the IMF uh, projects Saudi Arabia's economy to grow 7.6% in 2022. Right. So, so this is the highest rate for any country in the world. And this is not a sort of, quote, rising tide, tide lifts, lifts all boats situation because the IMF has downgraded its global growth forecast three times since January. Saudi Arabia is sort of going against a global downward economic trend. Clearly, energy prices have been a boon to major oil exporters, but is, is this the only reason for Saudi Arabia's booming economy, or are there other factors that you see that are contributing to this really outstanding growth? Right. Well, let me give you the short story. Uh, I think we have a, a great economy uh, that exists in the past. However, uh, we were controlled by oil prices. Oil prices used to manage and plan our our projects, our investment, our uh, uh, human capital, etc. Uh, then 2016, the Crown Prince came with this vision, the 2030 vision, that set up everything with uh, good guidelines, directions to make sure we are not uh, dependent on oil anymore. We have to diversify our economy. We have to make the local content at its best. And at the same time, to make sure our economy is more open now for investment and uh, competitive comparing to, to the other countries and regions. Looking at Saudi Arabia, it's the largest economy in the Middle East. And uh, given its uh, uh, location and how it's connect the world and everything is about a couple hours far away from any port in Saudi Arabia, with the uh, infrastructure that we have and the transportation roads, etc., ports, uh, I think it's time to for the giant who was sleeping to wake up now and use its muscles and at the same time make sure to 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 use the the gaps and utilize them that we did not use them in the past. So the 2030 vision came with ambitious targets with with uh, 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 many programs about 13 programs and each program has a couple initiatives and they tackle some not only economic reforms but structural reforms. The government performance, the laws, the justice, uh, the way how we handle business, uh, the way how we communicate, the media, etc. And more importantly, is investing in people and human capital. So all these together came as a package with the Crown Prince uh, uh, vision, and we started uh, implementing in 2016, seven years ago, these initiatives and plans and. Uh, what's happening today as a result, it's not random or happened as a coincidence. It's because of what has been done the last six years or seven years of reforms and changing the economy to make it stronger, the financial position uh, uh, better, and at the same time, make everything available uh, for investors, for uh, uh, for the government even to, to share with, with friends who would like to invest in Saudi Arabia. Uh, so... When it was 2020, when COVID hit every economy in the world, we were only one or maybe one of few countries that grew NFDI positively, while the rest of the world declined by 35%. Uh, so we grew by uh, about 18 or 19% uh, in 2020. We get more investors coming to the country. And at the same time, uh, we witnessed more new uh, promising sectors that did not exist in the past, including tourism, entertainment, sports, uh, ICT, all these sectors started to be the, the hot topic in Saudi Arabia the last two years. Uh, maybe you have heard uh, Saudi Arabia was ranked the second globally uh, uh, out of the countries that recovered very well from COVID and handled the healthcare very well in 2020 and 2021. Uh, we had a lockdown early uh, enough. We uh, managed to take care of people's health. Uh, the king uh, uh, decided to have a free health uh, care to everyone who lives in Saudi Arabia, either Saudi or non-Saudi. Uh, we made sure we are the first to invest in, in these vaccines uh, to make sure also to compensate the medium and small uh, enterprises who suffered uh, from, from, from COVID and its uh, impact. So I think this package came up to build a stronger economy. Uh, we, 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 we rely more on the non-oil GDP, which is the driver of the economy today. 
and it's growing the best among, uh, uh, as you said, global countries. And as the IMF said today, they just published an article uh, 30 minutes ago, and they think the article for for Saudi Arabia will be published uh, as we speak now uh, by the IMF, and they rank Saudi Arabia as the fastest growing economy in the world uh, in 2022. I saw you posted that that article on on LinkedIn, and we have we do a daily newsletter called the Sustig Review, and that's already loaded in because that's a really good article that you referenced in that uh, that IMF. Um, uh, you know, we we've talked a lot about the nine six six about how well Saudi Arabia managed the COVID uh, challenge, and and I think you're referencing maybe the Bloomberg, uh, Bloomberg did a, a global ranking where Saudi Arabia came in second, and they. Uh, you're exactly right. Uh, right. The, ki- the kingdom, uh, you know, had significant experience with these kinds of, of uh, challenges and moved quickly, relied on the science. And, uh, and it's interesting that you point out because they clearly came out of the COVID uh, period. Uh, Saudi Arabia came out uh, more quickly recovered and stronger than a lot of other countries. Um, let, can we talk about the crown prince? We, we, you, you referenced the crown prince in, in introducing Vision 2030 in 2016. He recently introduced an, uh, the national investment strategy. Uh, and, and this was in October 2021. And at that, when he, when he discussed the national investment uh, strategy and first inter- launched it, he said, quote, the national investment strategy is all about empowering investors, offering investment opportunities, providing financing solutions and enhancing competitiveness, competitiveness, unquote. And as you you know well, Dr. Saad, the the NIS, the National Investment Strategy, has really ambitious goals. It's seeking to reach $3.3 trillion in accumulated investments by 2030. By design, the Ministry of Investment is right at the heart of the National Investment Strategy. And and we're about 10 months away from October when, when the Crown Prince announced the NIS. Can you discuss how you see it progressing and the role uh, MISA is is playing within that national investment strategy? Uh, right. So to continue the story that I just told you for the first question, uh, after the Crown Prince introduced the 2030 vision, uh, some programs gradually start kicking off to build the infrastructure of the economy to make sure that the business environment in Saudi Arabia is better than ever and at the same time making doing businesses easier than uh, than ever uh, before uh, so we used to have what it's called uh, sagia which is the saudi uh, authority for investment promotion and it was only focusing on uh, promoting the investment globally uh, for foreign investors not even for the domestic investment and the crown prince decided to establish or decide to make an order to establish the Ministry of Investment in 2022, Mm. sorry, in 2020. And that's when COVID hit us. So it was not uh, the best year for an investment to grow in Saudi Arabia, although we did, I would say, okay, in 2020, as I said, uh, we grew about 18 to 19% uh, in that year. However, uh, the Crown Prince announced the National Investment Strategy and it was uh, full of all what we had missed in the past. We have to empower the, the, the investment uh, in Saudi Arabia and make all the investors are, are close and reach all in, opportunities in Saudi Arabia. So as you know, the country is huge. It's full of opportunities, either in energy, non-energy. We have each region with, with specifications and, and different uh, opportunities. We have different sectors. So the, the NIS came with a couple of pillars. One of them is to uh, make incentives and financing uh, reachable to any investor, either local or international, mm-hmm. uh, and make sure there are some incentives that are competitive with other countries, including exemptions of tax, lands, bridging loans, uh, uh, different ways of incentives. And at the same time, uh, we have to provide all opportunities from supply side. So as a country, we supply opportunities, but also we welcome any demand. So if you as a friend coming from the US or Europe or anywhere in the world, and you have an idea to invest in Saudi Arabia, we still welcome this idea. And actually we provide any incentive and uh, empowerment that needed 
to make this project successful. So we feel it's not our only success, it's a win-win case. So we welcome anyone who comes to the country. But also, the NIS came with, with 40, 40 uh, initiatives. These initiatives, one of them is, for example, uh, uh, making the businesses easy in Saudi Arabia, uh, trying to uh, make sure that there is no restrictions when it comes to uh, uh, someone coming to the country and providing all the incentives and building uh, uh, a great uh, exporting zones like the economic special zones. So we are working all these, on, on these initiatives to make sure we have a very uh, competitive uh, uh, environment in, in the country. But at the same time, if you remember also, Richard, in, in, in October last year, we announced uh, the global companies to move to Saudi Arabia and the headquarters need to move. And during the FII, we had about 44 uh, uh, big companies, giant companies move to, to Riyadh and Saudi Arabia. And we had more this year. So the number is growing. And there is no surprise because uh, every investor is thirsty for investment and the country is providing uh, the best meal when it comes to, to, to investment. So uh, we have witnessed a great opportunities. The number of licenses, number of deals increased and tripled and even uh, 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 doubled in some quarters more than ever uh, uh, before. Uh, this all said, this, this has been said, we have what, we, what it called Invest Saudi. And Invest Saudi is a platform that unify all opportunities in Saudi Arabia and market them and promote them uh, uh, globally and in, uh, locally. So we have been successful to uh, build the phase two of this platform and make sure all the opportunities, content, numbers, statistics, reports available in this uh, platform to make sure that there is only one stop shop for any investor to come to Saudi Arabia or even local investors and find it clearly. Looking at the numbers in 2021 and the first, uh, I would say one or second quarter of 2022, we have exceeded our targets when it comes to FDI. So we have an annual target from 2021 until 2030. And in 2021, we exceeded our FDI target by 170%. Uh, so uh, that tells you uh, there is a seriousness and commitment and uh, uh, achievement. The same thing in Q1 uh, 2022, we had about 10% growth in the first quarter of FDI. And we accept, expect the, 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 the numbers of second quarter coming very soon in the next quarter. So, we have witnessed uh, a great achievement, but you know what? We have a long way to do, and we are uh, uh, still thirsty for more and more. It's interesting you mentioned the four pillars of that NIS strategy. That first pillar is investment opportunities, which again comes back to the Ministry of Investment and all the things you're doing. And the IMF, uh, and by the way, I really want to compliment you on the Mises uh, quarterly reports. Uh, they're outstanding and they're a tremendous resource for anybody who's interested in doing business, is doing business. And, um, but uh, one of the things they mentioned in, the, in this second quarter report was that IMF had commended the kingdom for its, quote, improved ease of doing business with one stop shop to register a business taking only three minutes, unquote. Uh, I know this is an important right. goal for MISA. Uh, and there are, and the regional headquarters program also is exceptionally, exceptionally important. As you say, you referred earlier to a sleeping giant, Saudi Arabia, a sleeping giant, and it's waking up. And I think that regional headquarters program reflects this, you know, uh, companies going, okay, if we're going to be doing business in Saudi Arabia, we need to be in Saudi Arabia, especially if we're doing business for the government. And I hope that program's going along well. You said yeah. it was going along nicely. Um. Are there other steps that you're taking with, for example, that that report, um, the recent report, we, we commented that there are actual QR codes at the end of that report where you can get into portals, key portals, key Ministry of Investment portals on right. how to do business, you know, the legal aspects, how you can get uh, uh, financial and, and, and uh, tax support, these sorts of subsidies. It was it's really a useful document, making things much easier. Um, right. Is there something, can you discuss steps? You, you've taken these steps. Are there other planned improvements? For example, um, uh, 
uh, I, I'm reading a little bit about Miza, M-I-Z-A. Right. Uh, right. Can you tell us a little bit about what that is? So uh, what you said is, is, is totally correct. And I thank you for, uh, for mentioning what you have seen in the report. In that report, we, we uh, uh, focus on uh, a couple promising sectors every quarter. So in Q2, right. we focused on tourism. And the tourism is one of the booming uh, sectors uh, in Saudi Arabia for the last couple uh, years. And I'll tell you, tell you one, 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 one story about the tourism. When, when COVID uh, happened in 2020, one of the biggest drivers of the, no, of, of the growth of, of, of the GDP of Saudi Arabia was the tourism, although every, yes. everything was locked. But I think we prepared everything before COVID and uh, it was the best uh, uh, investment for, for domestic people. So people start discovering uh, Abha in south of Saudi Arabia, Asir, maybe you have heard of it. They start uh, discovering some nice areas in the Red Sea, Neum, Al Ula, uh, uh, different uh, uh, cities. I do want to uh, forget uh, some of them. So the, the consumption and the demand by locals was, was very uh, significant and high. And that supported uh, the GDP in 2020. But going to that report, we were thinking about uh, last year with the minister, how we improve this report to make sure if any investor comes to Saudi Arabia, doesn't need to go to all these websites and look for GDP, look for employment, look for uh, uh, stats, numbers, uh, regulations. So we have to gather them in, in one document, but it has to be friendly uh, a, a document that you can read and, and get some videos, get some uh, clips, infographics, etc. So we have uh, uh, a great you know, team that support us uh, uh, in, in building this. And uh, I have to comment on one thing. Most of my team uh, uh, in my deputy ships and at MISA are, are uh, females. So the mm. females are doing great in Saudi Arabia. They are part of this huge contribution to the GDP. Uh, we had a target to reach 30% of females in the, in the workforce by 2030, but we reached 35% last mm -hmm. year. So mm -hmm. we exceeded our target. And uh, I would say without them, we would not be in this, in this, in this uh, situation. So thank you to, to them. And I'm, I'm worried about guys now. They're going to get mad at me. Because <laughs> they <don't laughs> I'm worried but, about uh, guys too. <laughs> but uh, I, have to, I, have, <laughs> I have to admit the truth. Uh, going to MISA, MISA is one of the uh, uh, services that MISA wants to provide to investors, either locally or internationally, where we provide door-to-door uh, -door services, the journey of the investor from the day he or she thinks about investment until you proceed even in your investment, even later on uh, uh, through this uh, program. Uh, it's it's uh, uh, a program that will help to know everything about the country support you to get any, any uh, regulations done, uh, procedures, uh, processes, whatever, and keep you boosted with the new opportunities, with the new incentives coming up, with the new uh, sectors, with the new regions that we discover uh, uh, in, in Saudi Arabia. So uh, it's, it's about to uh, finish in the final stage, and we expect uh, most of people will get benefit of it, and it's optional at the same time, but uh, it, it does not require a lot of fees, but at the same time, it will provide an excellent and golden opportunities to understand more about anything uh, that related to services and business in Saudi Arabia. It looks fascinating, and it's it's available for both domestic and international investors. And and it looks financial and tax advisory, business setup services, logistics, site rental services. I mean, it, you know, in terms of you know ease of doing business, it it, it seems like a really a promising addition for any anybody right. that's interested. Can we return yeah. briefly to tourism? Because I agree with you, uh, and and we've commented on this show how how uh, readable those reports are. They're easily accessed. There's a lot of information, but it's nicely nicely formatted and arranged. And uh, in the in the first quarter, the fo the sort of sectoral focus was on real estate. This last uh, quarter was on tourism. Uh, and uh, as with so many things with Saudi Arabia, when, when something is announced, it seems so ambitious. The numbers are so big. But then as, as the progress.
begins and the implementation gets underway, you see that it might be possible. And I say that specifically with that 100 million you know, goal, 100 million visitors goal by 2030. You hit 62 million last year. And as you say, a lot of that was domestic uh, tourism, which is important. But increasingly, that 100 million seems to be possible by 2030. But uh, tourism yeah. is in itself, and I say tourism and hospitality is, a, is what I call sort of a linchpin industry because it creates so much employment. It's also now the, the, the government is, is um, you know, improving its aviation services. And, it, and obviously right. visas are, are more easily acquired now. Can you tell us a little bit, talk a little bit more about tourism, especially because it's so important that Red Sea, the Red Sea uh, development is starting, starting to come online and that sort of thing. And obviously, Aula is an amazing place. Um, right. Tourism, as you mentioned, is a really key industry. Right. So one of the things that, that we are proud of is we get a lot of uh, calls today and requests from different countries. They want to visit Saudi Arabia and they want to see what they have seen in YouTube or the pictures that they've seen in some social media uh, channels, etc. So uh, there are some sites and locations in the country that n- nobody discovered in the past. And the Crown Prince vision about tourism is to make this uh, at the best quality and make it available for everyone local or international, and make it uh, very easy to, to reach to that uh, area. So first, we have to build the infrastructure and make sure the roads, ports, uh, aircrafts are at its best. And that's already exist even before uh, we thought about tourism. However, uh, the services that you need in these locations have to be uh, at, at, at its best level, best level. So if you look at Al-Ula, uh, the hotels that we have right now are, are uh, a five-star global uh, international uh, hotels with high quality. If you look at Neum, you look at uh, the Red Sea, you see these resorts uh, that, that they were built lately. Uh, at Dar'iya also, we have it as one of uh, one of the developments and projects mm-hmm. that exist in Saudi Arabia. So we have a lot of options. And if you want the heat, there are places for the heat. If you want very cold, <laughs> you can go to south or north. I grew up in south of Saudi Arabia where it goes below zero in the, in the, in the, in the winter. And the highest in the summer was about 20 degrees uh, Celsius. So it's, it's, it's a great place in, in, in the south and it's green mountains. But right. if you like desert and you like to ride camels, if you like to do uh, uh, you know, car racing, you want to do whatever, then you can go to, to, uh, to Riyadh, you can go to the north of Saudi Arabia. So we have different regions and different countries in one country uh, with with different specifications so it's 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 a it's a great opportunity and that's what I meant when I said we have opportunities and there was a gap in the few in the past we did not use and utilize these opportunities and it was about time to uh, make the infrastructure uh, uh, with a good quality and make them available and ready for everyone so we welcome everyone today and we used part of this uh, a blessing that we have when we get countries to visit us to make them go and visit these sites. So in 2022, for example, we had about uh, 20 or 25 uh, uh, forums, investment forums in, in, in Saudi Arabia. But in, 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 in aligned with these forums, we have the delegations, either ministers or prime ministers or even presidents to go and visit these historical places, uh, visit the uh, cultural places, visit tourism in different areas. And they found it, you know, the first thing you see in their faces, like, wow, what is this? And they start thinking about investing in these places. So we have colleagues from different countries who start saying, you know, I want to invest in Al-Ula, I want to invest in Red Sea. And so it's it's a great opportunity to show the people and make them, make everything ready for them and available to to, uh, win, win, case let's let's talk about investments and i agree with you that saudi arabia is extraordinary i bet you're wishing you could be in Sauda now and since you're in in riyadh in august i know i know i know my Um, family is enjoying Sauda now but not me but uh, (laughs) uh you mentioned earlier you know one of the interesting things about vision 2030 is that the metrics that 
that you know these are benchmarks that every agency, every authority, every ministry is expected to hit. And I know uh, Misa takes theirs very seriously. And one of the good thing, one of the interesting things about this quarterly report, and we return to it again because again we thought it was outstanding, is it lists key deals. And you had uh, you know right. in the, that uh, second quarter, forty nine closed deals. Um, 925 million dollars in expected investments, close to 2,000 jobs to be created. Important benchmarks. I really liked also that it went through and it it described deals in different key sectors. Right. So, in terms of, are you happy with the deal flow? I know it's been positive, but and you and you seem to be very optimistic that people are coming. The interest level is very high in terms of actually, you know, sealing and closing deals. Right. Well, uh, if you want the truth, I'm not really happy because I, I want more. So <laughs> I, I want more deals coming. However, I think we are achieving uh, a good level of uh, deals so far uh, and better than what happened the last decade. Uh, so when, when the NIS started, we had to do some analysis and see what are the priority sectors and look at these sectors and focus on them because we knew they would be the driver of the economy job creation, diversification, local content, and make uh, uh, the economy more sustainable over the medium and long term. So tourism is one of them. ICT, uh, technology with, with different elements, uh, renewable energy, uh, yeah. uh, entertainment, uh, real estate, logistics, and, and uh, transportation. So these are key uh, sectors that we focused on, and they will have the more focus from incentives as well. Uh, so uh, we were successful so far, and I think they are the strength now of the country. I know there are some traditional sectors that still drive the economy going forward. However, uh, we we are focusing on, on the sector that we had gap in, and we have to fill it. And the, the gap is huge, and that's why we have a huge uh, uh, ambitious targets, because we know every real and dollar will be spent in these sectors will have a higher and higher multiplier either for the economy or the investment. So, uh, yes, this is the sector that we focus on. However, we still welcome any, any, any ideas and any, any uh, demanded uh, opportunities in different sectors. I asked you, and this may be uh, so you can decline to, to comment on this, but you gave us a really good uh, uh, outline and description of MISA, M-I-Z-A, also recently announced as something that a Saudi Investment Promotion Authority. Right. Uh, and, you know, this, I guess, this is also another another specific, you know, uh, agency to help, you know, enable integration and cooperation between entities. And it's, I guess, it's linked right. with Invest Saudi. Is it, can you, disc can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, sure. Uh, as I mentioned, maybe earlier, uh, the Saudi economy is blessed with different sectors that has a uh, rich of, of opportunities and investment ideas. So manufacturing, industrial uh, uh, sectors, uh, uh, looking at ICT, tourism, real estate, and each sector is led by a ministry today. And you have to unify all these ideas and opportunities through one platform. So the idea is to have an, a Saudi IPA that will unify and coordinate all these efforts and make sure they come through one channel and one single source of truth, as if, if we can say, uh, making sure it's easier for uh, Saad, Steve, Ahmed, whoever, globally or locally, to look at one place and find the opportunity ready look at the content of the opportunity, what incentives are provided, and delegate uh, the right investor to the right entity. So the, the new Saudi IPA is, is going to be handling the coordination and unifying all the efforts between the countries and between the, the entities, and at the same time promote for, for uh, the, the Saudi investment opportunities. At the same time, it will be in charge of the unified platform, which is Invest Saudi. And it will make sure to have it advanced and improved over the medium term and long term as well. Uh, third point is about uh, uh, 
coordinating any investment promotion plans by other entities. So if you have a plan for education, for healthcare, for whatever real estate, we can support in building the plan and coordinate it with the, the, the relevant entity and make sure it's uh, marketable and ready to, to be ready for, for, for the market and for the investor. Uh, but also at the same time, is, is uh, building uh, a better outreach. So in our NIS, one of the initiatives is to build uh, about 10 or 11 uh, international offices for MISA. Hmm. So the, I, the Saudi IPA will be in charge of these offices and reach out to key countries, including the US, China, Asia, Europe, Africa, all these countries. And these offices will be active to promote from these sites. Uh, and, and that's the idea of the IPA. But at the same time, the IPA, the Saudi IPA will be even in charge of more reports and analysis, studies, statistics that we have to build and, and provide it to investors. So this is a, a short story of, of the mandate that, that was uh, assigned for, for the Saudi IPA. And we are working day and night to make sure uh, we have it uh, ready uh, very soon. That's a that's a that's a it sounds like a wonderful initiative and very promising and it, it'll be interesting to see how it develops, and it speaks to Saudi Arabia does have a really intriguing, fascinating, attractive story to tell, and uh, I, I feel like um, I feel like Saudi Arabia is is telling it better, and uh, you know Misa obviously is clearly invested in making sure that the accurate accurate story is out there and that the real mm-hmm. opportunities are told. Um, Lucian, did you want to add anything? I was just going to, I would like to finish I, actually, if we could with, um, I just uh, want to add one, one thing oh, please, before sure. the story, sure. if you allow me, I think if there is one bad thing that we, we did in the past is we did not tell our story. <laughs> so yes. yep. I think it's about time now to build these platforms and channels to tell who, uh, uh, the facts about Saudi Arabia, the fact about the achievements, the ambitious, but about the commitment and, and, and seriousness. To, to, to achieve and to be part of this uh, strong uh, uh, global economy. You know, if I might add to that, one of the interesting things about the tourism sector, but also a lot of other things is, is you know, there's, they're finding some extraordinarily important archeological sites in Saudi Arabia. And um, on top of that, a lot of Vision 2030 is about culture. And you, you, you see an emphasis on, on National Day and Founding Day and, and, and Saudi Arabia's history. And, and we talk a lot about the 966, all the ongoing festivals, you know, camel festivals, dates, mm-hmm. coffee, falcons. It's a pride. There's a great pride in the culture and there's a great pride in the, in the history. And you see that coming forward now ever has in the past, you know, speaking again to your reference to the story. Right. So, and, and that's a great transition because my question is actually about your story, Dr. Saad. Um, you uh, sure. were a professor at Washington State University. You have a PhD and two master's degrees from Washington State University, Wazoo, the Cougars. Um, that's a lot of time you spent in the United States. Could you tell us a little bit about it um, and, and a little bit about how you chose Washington State University? Uh, yeah, well, my, my parents are teachers and they grew up uh, among a uh, low-income uh, family. And my dad, I was, I, I'm the oldest, and my dad always say that you have to, 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 to be uh, a PhD uh, one day uh, when I was little. So he was putting this in my mind and I was like, you know what, uh, I will do whatever. So I was a young teenager and I was, you know, not obeying a lot of what he said. Uh, but he was guiding me a lot. And if there is a, a, a thank I want to give, I would give it to my parents because they were the reason behind uh, where I am today. However, uh, I think I'm an example of what the country can provide today. Uh, we have a country of opportunities and everyone has a, a fair opportunity today. I was growing in a small village in the south of, the, of Saudi Arabia. Um, in a school ranch uh, with my family. Uh, I used to walk to school a couple kilos and uh, no cars, nothing. But I had an ambitious uh, uh, plan in my mi- mind to be one day uh, in, in, in working in one of the best international financial institutions. Uh, 
I love math a lot. I'm, I'm a number guy. I like to work with equations. Uh, and that's why I specialized my undergraduate in, 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 uh, in, in mathematics. And when I graduated, I was looking for any opportunity to go to the United States because I know the education over there is, uh, is the best uh, in my personal views. And I want to learn more about the culture there, people. I, I, I used to watch a lot of movies when I was young, and I get, uh, you know, attracted to, to visit the States. So uh, I found a program at the Central Bank, used to be called the Saudi, uh, Saudi Arabian Monetary Agency, which is now the Central Bank of Saudi Arabia, which is called Economist Program. So they said you have to shift from math to economics in order to send you to the United States and study over there. And I said, I'm, I'm for it. I will go for it. So uh, I joined that program and they sent me to the, to the, to the U.S. And also I want to thank the Central Bank because uh, it was uh, the reason behind my scholarship and success uh, for my educational uh, career. I went to the U.S. and I was looking for... Uh, uh, a tough school to cha challenge myself, but at the same time, a place where I can really witness the, uh, the, the snow. Uh, I hear about the snow and coming from Saudi Arabia, I said, I want to I wanna witness the snow. <laughs> and uh, someone advised me and they said, you know, go to Pullman, Washington State. It's, it's, uh, it snows six, seven months uh, a year and very nice people. It's a farm area. Uh, it's like where you grow up and uh, try it. So I applied. I was ex accepted in that uh, school. Uh, luckily, the, the dean or the director of the college was also a math background. So he supported my, my application. And uh, I want to say thank, thanks to him. His name is Ron Mittelhammer. He used to be one of my advisors through my uh, studies. And uh, I started doing economics. It was not uh, difficult because it's all about math calculus algebra so it was it was not not hard but i had to to learn the theory by 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 uh, uh heart and when i finished my uh, masters in economics he advised me to to do a, a masters in statistics before i do my phd because my phd in economics will be more advanced of calculus and statistics so i did another masters in statistics it was uh, also uh, a good uh, story in my my life then they accepted me in the PhD program and they did my uh, dissertation on the Saudi economy di diversification and uh, uh, sustainability using some econometrics because of my background in math. I graduated in 2008 uh, and I was uh, picked to be uh, one of the guys to uh, deliver the graduation speech that year uh, during the ceremony. So it was also another uh, successful chapter in my life. But when I was also doing my PhD, I was uh, teaching some undergrad economics, especially econometrics and macroeconomics. And I opened and established Arabic language program in yeah. Wazoo. So nice. uh, that, was, that was one of the, the uh, stories that I will never forget. Uh, I came back to the Central Bank of Saudi Arabia. Uh, then uh, I was picked to uh, build, uh, if you have heard of the GCC Single Currency Union or Council that was established in 2008. So I was one of the uh, founders of, of that council in 2008, 9 and 10. But at the same time, I, I, I like teaching. I love teaching. I, I think I, I can communicate with people. I, I enjoy going deep in discussions and analysis. So I used to teach at the evening at Prince Sultan University for the MBA program. Uh, we teach bankers some economic, econometrics, uh, economics, monetary policy, etc. Then I had the chance to apply to the IMF, which is still one of my dreams when I was young. And uh, thanks again to the central bank, they supported my, my application. And I was admitted at the, at, the, at the IMF in Washington, and they went back to, to the U.S., which is uh, another dream, you know, after I, I, I lived in it for about eight, nine years. And uh, Washington was also another uh, successful story because people there are, are multicultural from different countries, different regions, uh, a lot of business uh, men over there. And in the IMF, uh, I learned everything uh, by the book. 
how to communicate with people, how to build a policy, how to do an economic analysis, how to even negotiate in missions and visiting countries, etc. So it was it was a really successful uh, uh, story. And I think it was a second PhD for me when I worked in the IMF for five years. Mm. Uh, then I was called by the Minister of uh, Finance, His Excellency Ibrahim al uh, the former uh, Minister of Finance. And he said, we want to uh, establish a new uh, macroeconomic and fiscal policy department in the Ministry of Finance. So I agreed. I went there in 2016. We built that department and it grew and it became a deputy ship. So I was uh, assigned as a deputy minister for macroeconomic and fiscal policies until end of 2020. Then His Excellency Khalid Al-Falih uh, called me and he wanted me to build a new economic uh, analysis and studies Deputy ship at Ministry of Investment. So I welcome the idea. And who doesn't work with Khaled Al Faleh? You know, it's a challenging uh, job, but it's a uh, it's a great uh, opportunity. So it's been now almost two years in in MISA, and uh, I'm acting as another uh, deputy minister for uh, uh, investment promotion. So I I, mm-hmm. I supervise two deputy <clears throat> ships right now. I'm enjoying it. I I I like what I'm doing right now. I'm in love with it, and I hope. Uh, I can contribute to the country, to the people who supported me. At least uh, something makes them happy and and successful. So this is the short story. I'm sorry, I'm, I took too much time. <laughs> no, <before>. no, no. <laughs> that's a wonderful story, and that's a very Saudi story. Uh, in terms of you know a, a young Saudi, you know, in the south or somewhere, and, and it got an opportunity and made the best of it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And Dr. Saad Al Oh, go ahead. That sorry. being said, uh, look on. Looking at, that being said, looking at this, I think the country, our government is really uh, keen when it comes to human capital investment. So uh, you remember in 2005 when King uh, Abdullah visited the U.S. and the yes. King Abdullah program for scholarships started. So mm-hmm. we had hundreds of thousands of people go into the U.S. and different countries globally. So uh, without that program that continued until today, we would not see this well-educated young Saudis from males and females uh, running the vision and the ambitious target. So uh, that's a credit that, that we have to give to the government uh, from that time until now for all the support that they give uh, as an investment and in, 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 in its people. In terms, of, in terms of U.S. and Saudi Arabia, but also, uh, you know, we're talking about Saudi Arabia and educational opportunities. I don't think Lucian and I can point to a more consequential or important program than mm-hmm. that scholarship program started in 2005, yeah. and it's been adapted. Mm-hmm. But the the results have been nothing but extraordinary. Yep. Right. Right. And the investment's paying off right now. Dr. Saad Al Shahrani, yes. Deputy Minister for Economic Affairs and Investment Studies at the Ministry of Investment. Thank you so much for your time today, Dr. Saad. This was a really great discussion. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. Uh, it's really a pleasure of, of, of talking to you and to Richard. And uh, uh, it's one of the things that I enjoy. So thank you again. And I appreciate the support. This was wonderful. Greatly appreciate it. That was our conversation with Dr. Saad Al Shahrani. A reminder that you can watch Just See interviews or Just See segments on YouTube if you want to just get to what you want to get to. You can also search Richard on our YouTube page, which I was doing recently, and you know we've we've actually produced a lot of content here um, over the last <laughs> yeah, year or yeah. so. So there's a lot of good stuff there. If there's something mm-hmm. you're looking for that's a good place to do it um but thank you to dr Saad and the folks at misa because that was, that was just a great discussion and it hasn't even been a year it's been closer to you know eight months six to eight months and i i look at that and go oh my goodness we've been busy it's it's quite rewarding to see it but it's just also a tremendous resource because there's a lot there agreed it hasn't been a year it seems like a little longer than that oh my goodness. <laughs> but... no. uh-uh. Um, our, you're right. It's been about eight, uh, eight months. Our, yeah. our first one was with Abdullah Hassan in late September last year. But then remember, we were going to do a monthly. Yeah. And then our next one didn't come till October. So we sort of we sort of uh, very, you know, put our toes in the water towards the end of 2021. And I, I, I just sort of feel like we launched in 2022. So yeah. I mean, because when we, we went hard on weekly, uh, you know, I think early this year. It's cool. I mean, it was a, a real lesson in just getting it out there and like just launching and and then using, 
you know, feedback and experience to make it better. Um, they always say that, you know, some of the, some of the companies that didn't succeed are always because they just waited too long to launch. And we just got out there and started just talking to each other and, uh, it's doing really well. So congrats if, if to you, sir. If, if, if your suggestion left before we looked, I think you're actually perfectly on, <laughs> on target. <laughs> yeah. Cause once we got out there flying through the air going, oh my goodness. How We're like, oh this? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Richard, let's get to yellow. What do you think? Yella, number one. Yellow. Saudi. Yalla. Saudi Yalla. in a minute. <laughs> we, oh, almost, we almost didn't do I, it. I blew we it. Didn't. <laughs> but I blew it. Saudi in a minute. Saudi in a minute. <laughs> Yalla. Um, high oil prices help Saudi. Number one, high oil prices help Saudi Arabia earn $88 billion in the first half. Uh, Saudi energy company Aramco reported that it's a pro- that is profit has jumped 90% in the second quarter compared to the same time last year, helping its half-year earnings reach nearly $88 billion. Aramco's net profits were helped by second quarter earnings ending in June that hit $48.4 billion, a figure higher than all of the first six months of 2021 when profits reached just $47 billion. When profits reached just Forty-seven billion. That's it. Forty-seven billion. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, I mean, for a week for, after, oh, just sorry, just a minute. It yeah. sets a new quarterly earnings record for Aramco since it first floated around five percent of the company on the Saudi stock stock market in late 2019. So there was another good stock buy. We wish we had our crystal ball for. Um, well, no, actually, the 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 stock hasn't gone up. Stock went down slightly. This is the, the, the conundrum. Oh. This is why I don't understand anything. You know, they have an eighty-eight billion dollar first half. And the stock drops a few percentage points. Hmm. Yeah. So maybe it wasn't a good <laughs> stock to buy. But as, as sort of context here, that's almost this second quarter figure is almost what they made all of last year, um, which is insane. Um, also, other oil companies, Richard, are doing really well. Obviously, Exxon Mobil, Chevron, Shell all saw really strong quarters um, for obvious reasons. Yeah, it's a theme. And, you know, BP, Chevron, Exxon Mobil, Shell, Total, all the things you, you know, they're on track to report 60 billion in profits this second quarter. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Aramco and, will pay a huge dividend to 18.8 billion uh, on, in the second quarter to shareholders. So that's, that's something. And well, that's what most of them are doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, those, those five oil giants that I mentioned, uh, they're, they're spent more than 20 billion on buybacks in the first half of the year. And, and this is one of the concerns. It's not going to capital expenditures. Saudi Arabia, I mean, Aramco has $40 billion this year committed to, to capital expenditures, but you know, this is the great concern. We're here, we, 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 you know, we're having some fossil fuel sort of shortages and, and, you know, you have activist board members, you have uh, government policy, all sort of dissuading uh, major oil companies to from investing because, you know, in the long term, and we're seeing the results on the market. Uh, but anyway, in the meantime, they're making a, a boatload of money. A boatload, $88 billion is a lot of money. That's in, in one quarter too. I mean, that's the, that's like the size of every NFL team put together. Um, I mean, that's a lot of coin. The math on that. It, it defies comprehension. It does. The first thing that I would do, Richard, if I had $88 billion is purchase a Lucid uh, Air car and then just, you know, park it somewhere and leave it, put the keys in there and be like, hey, somebody want a Lucid? This thing is awesome. <laughs> um, you, know what? You, you, you carry around Lucids in your pockets and give them as tips. Just hand them out. You get a Lucid like <laughs> here's, Oprah. Here's a, you get a Lucid. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for your service. <laughs> that was awesome. Here's a, here's a Lucid. I would be very, very popular very quickly. <laughs> you know, Lucian, if I, if I had $88 billion, I, I'd give you half. You would give me half. So you give me 44 billion. That's pretty good. That's really billion. nice, Richard. I would give yeah. you maybe 30 billion, <laughs> maybe a little less. <laughs> well, and I think there's a, this is, this, this is, the, you know, there's an inequality in our relationship. I'm much more committed, I think. Because <laughs> uh, I don't know that I could squeak by on 30 billion, but if that's what you want to do, go ahead. I just want to watch you suffer, to be honest. <laughs> 30 billion, you know, I mean, 
what can you really get for that these days with the I'll find I'll find a way. <laughs> <laughs> a yellow number two, timeout Riyadh restaurant awards shortlist 22. Excuse me, I'm gonna have to read that again. <laughs> timeout Riyadh's restaurant awards shortlist for 2022. The nominees have been revealed, Richard, for more than 20 years. Timeout's reviewers have conducted anonymous independent restaurant visits in the region booking anonymously and paying for every meal in order to establish which restaurants are truly worth diners times and money. The timeout restaurant awards are the longest running, most established dining restaurant awards in the middle East in 2022, the timeout Riyadh restaurant awards will be held for the very first time following 12 months of anonymous restaurant reviews, taking in all corners of the city and the full spectrum of price points and dining experiences. Timeout presents a short list of 150 of Riyadh's best restaurants across 17 categories. The winners will be revealed September 15th, Richard. I want to see that list, but this is extraordinary. You know, we throw in, like in our daily review, Seustic Review, we'll throw in, I think recently, for example, just what the top streaming shows are in Saudi Arabia. And what's, I, I, I do that in, in part just because it's always striking because it's very much like what we're watching. You know, when I look at that list, I'm going, well, I'm, I'm watching half these shows. Last week, we talked about the opening weekend uh uh, gate for bullet train and, and the international Saudi Arabia was listed. And the, the, the larger point being is it was notable just because Saudi Arabia is in the list, you know, they've come from nowhere and now they're actually a, a viable market for cinema. So, I mean, they, I mean two things on this timeout Riyadh report for timeout timeout has been doing this for 20 years without throughout the region. They've never done it in Saudi Arabia. And there's a reason why. I mean, there's not enough there to pick from. Right. And now they're doing a short list, a short list of 150 of Riyadh's best restaurants, Riyadh's, Riyadh's best restaurants, not Jeddah or the Eastern Brahmas, uh, across 17 categories. I looked at the list. It's just amazing. And it costs, you know, so uh, the foodie culture in, in Riyadh and Saudi Arabia is exploding. Yeah. And the categories span a huge range of cuisines i mean there's you've got italian and indian and then japanese and then you got saudi cuisine so i mean if you think mm -hmm. about it if you are running a saudi restaurant and your name gets on this list or and then if you win this competition yeah you are going to see a huge surge in business i mean if you're going to riyadh as an international businessman or as a tourist these days and you look up best saudi food restaurant in riyadh and this thing comes up i mean you're going to want to check it out uh, so that's really cool. Another uh, category, Richard, is afternoon tea and also cake. Yes. Uh, which is cool. <laughs> um, <laughs> Those are good pulls. That's right. Um, um, yeah. And when, you know, when do we see the first Michelin starred restaurant in Saudi Arabia? Have we had one? That's a great question. I don't know if we have. Um, you would have to assume it would be a, awarded to a, you know, an authentic Saudi food restaurant. I mean, I, Richard, you and I love Najd Village, which is yeah. um, in Riyadh and really gives you the Moy Authentico experience when you're there. You get the, the full sit down. It's really great. Um, so hoping that they're in the mix because their food rules. Um, but this is really cool. I mean, this is just more more modernization, really, is, is a way to describe it. So uh, apropos to nothing, uh, Jane and I went to a, a trivia night last night in a brewery near here. And uh, can you answer this question? So in uh, William Reed, William Reed is like Michelin. They rank restaurants all over the world. Uh, and in the top 50 restaurants uh, last year, how many of them were in France in the William Reed run? Um, <clears throat> I would say, and I could be way off, so maybe I'll edit this out, <laughs> but I would say <laughs> half of them are. I know that they have an, an, an crazy number of Michelin stars. What, what is that? They the... have Michelin stars, yeah. So I guess, I guess, I don't know. I guess something like that. I guess something like 22 or what, something like that. Zero. Mm -hmm. Really? I, yes, huh. zero. And I guess that maybe there's different criteria, but it also because there's competition all over the world now. But, um, you know, again, you know, from the original question of when we would get a Michelin starred restaurant in Riyadh, you know, maybe I'll have to check to see if there's a William Reed starred you know, uh, restaurant in, in, the, in Saudi Arabia. That's a great tr uh, trivia <clears throat> question. If you're looking to, you know, thin out the potential winners, because I think most people would not guess zero. Um, that's, that's, uh, kind no, of that's kind of, that's kind of incredible. One person got it right out of 30. 
you know, this is in groups. So I don't, you know, and that was just a wild guess. I'm sure. Unless they, unless they had their know. cell phone under the table. Unless, yeah. Unless they had a William <laughs> Reed representative there, you know, rating that, that brewery. Well, and it's going to be a while, I think, until breweries are on this list of dine out uh, yeah. restaurants in Riyadh. But uh, <laughs> especially since the dining fair was a taco food truck, next door, <laughs> which were very good, by the way. I love um, I love taco food trucks. So there you go. I mean, food trucks should be coming to Saudi soon uh, if they're not already there. So oh, there you yeah. go. Yeah. There's there's another thing, another area of development. Um, uh, this is, our, on this is one of the longest yellows we've had, Richard. It's all about <laughs> we food. Think, what a surprise. <laughs> we were thinking this was going to be a short yellow session because we we were anyway. Uh, number three, uh, digital payments exceed cash for first time in Saudi Arabia with 94% transaction value. Electronic payments exceeded the use of cash for the first time in Saudi Arabia in 2021 with these re- transactions representing 94% of all payments when measured by value a study conducted by the Saudi Central Bank revealed. In terms of volume, the use of electronic payments increased to 62% last year from 44% in 2019 across all areas of economic activities. The Saudi government sector has almost completely converted to electronic payment methods for all outward payments to individuals, business establishments, or other government agencies, the report noted. Yeah. And I don't have a ton to add here. Um, That's kind of happening globally, but the speed at which it's happening in Saudi is pretty impressive. Um, The pandemic really, um, you know, I mean, you remember at first it was, it was sort of thought it was passed hand to hand. So cash was so, um, you know, was very out, kind of learned that it was more airborne and stuff, but for a while it was like, oh, cash, how disgusting. (laughs) Um, you know, and, and so, um, yeah, this is interesting. It's very good for Saudi as they really embrace digital everything because having digital payments and Richard, we saw a good report this week. Um, you actually sent it to me. It was on, um, Saudi Arabia's FinTech, uh, space and how there's just a ton of opportunities there. So yeah, this is definitely good news for Saudi Arabia. I agree. And, and you, you capture it. There's not much to say here. I mean, the, they had a, they had a government priority in terms of digitizing and then they got these tailwinds, unfortunate tailwinds from the pandemic, which just, you know, gave it, uh, you know, mock for speed and you see the transition and it's all to the good mm-hmm. apart from the pandemic, but apart from the pandemic, which they did a really good job at managing. It really must be said. And we've said it before. Um, and we talked with Dr. Saad about that, uh, just how, yeah. how well it's all, it was all managed. So it's not just oil prices that are driving their economy. They just really were in a good position economically entering the post-pandemic world, which we're kind of still not in yet, actually. But um, <laughs> yellow number four, Richard, this um, this is a heavy one. Um, as President Biden looks to close Gitmo, Saudi Arabia emerges as an option, according to a report in The New York Times. 36 prisoners remain at Guantanamo Bay today, and Saudi Arabia's reintegration center for recovering Islamic extremists may be an option for President Biden, who is looking to close the detention center in Cuba. Saudi Arabia's program, with its campus in Riyadh and another in Jeddah, grew from a counterterrorism campaign that began in 2004 to re-educate citizens who had made their way home from jihadist training camps in Afghanistan and others influenced by them. Yeah, that is a big one. Did you pick this one? I picked this one because I wanted to make you talk about it, <laughs> and then I'm going to add nothing. Um, no, uh, this is a big one, and it's it's you know this is Guantanamo. You know, like a lot of the fevered reaction after 9/11. Um, you know, in hindsight, uh, it perhaps creates well, I think it, it creates more problems than it resolves. I mean, and certain certain policies that led to things like Abu Ghraib or Guantanamo, we'd like to have back, I think, you know, if we could go back and, and do it again. <clears throat> the difficulty is, is once something like Guantanamo is, is, is established, it's kind of hard to undo. And we've had just successive presidents struggling with how to do this. Um, you know, over the years, Guantanamo's had, you know, 780 men and boys. Uh, the peak being 660 there in 2003. Um, most of those, I mean, it's interesting. Of the of 732 men who have been freed from Guantanamo since the prison opened in January 2002, we just passed January, the 20-year anniversary. That, that is not say it with great pride or joy. You know, the, the law really had no influence on the release. They were just, you know, we've got to get these people back out. And, you know, who do we send them to? We don't want to necessarily send them back to their home country. Uh, who will take them? 
um, over the year, Saudi Arabia, I think, has taken 137 from Guantanamo. Uh, and, and, and I think one of the reasons there's a discussion here. So, for example, uh, several years ago, 20 were sent to the UAE with the understanding the UAE would house them and monitor them and that sort of thing. Essentially, what happened was the UAE turned around almost immediately repatriated them to their home countries. Which, at where, where they can go back to whatever they were doing, either or, you know, that wasn't the agreement. Um, Saudi Arabia is attractive as a potential option because they actually have a program. Um, you know, their uh, the the program that they have, you know, it's basically they have it's named the Mohammed bin Nayef Counseling and Care Center, and they have uh, care centers in Riyadh and Jeddah, and it's a it's a plan that is intended to sort of reintegrate these folks, re-educate, uh, uh, connect, reconnect them with their family uh, community ties, and essentially, you know, undo the brainwash that happens is how, how they term it. Um, and people criticize it, but this had a success. And again, to go back to the beginning, when, when the U.S. looks around at options, Saudi Arabia is really the only place that has mm-hmm. an ongoing system administration and setup to deal with trying to re-educate and re-acclimate these you know de-radicalize these individuals uh so i don't know if it's actually going to happen i I think it's maybe some of it's wishful thinking because you know we have five left yeah there's 37 left but five you know what we consider you know forever prisoners and they're not going to get out but it's just been a black mark for us. It's been a, a rallying call for extremists all over the world, simply because for so many of these, these who were detained, you know, there was no due process. They didn't have a trial. Um, so it's, it's uh, it, it, Biden, like Trump, like Obama uh, is trying to get out from under. Yeah. Um, I don't have a ton to add to the story, but I just wanted to make the observation that if you look at Saudi Arabia's program, it's pretty much the opposite of what America did with Guantanamo Bay. And, you know, there it's such this is a very complex issue. Obviously, each detainee has its own story, his or her own story. Um, but if you look at the the Saudi approach here, it's, you know, it's not to take these guys who were radicalized and um, you know, as you said, brainwashed or, you know, who, who could genu- genuinely be very bad people. Um, it, it lumps them all together and says, if we have a chance at putting you back into society and de-radicalizing you, we're going to do that. And we think the best way to do that is to not stick you in a cell by yourself in isolation, you know, and just to sit there and remain angry at why you're there. Cause there's just no improvement there. You're not, you're not going to learn anything. And so I th- sort of think, it's just two very, very different approaches here. And the Saudi approach is, hey, um, you know, we, we understand you've been very radicalized and you've done some very bad things. We're not here to excuse these things. But, you know, there is a society for you to rejoin if you want to rejoin. And that doesn't mean it's like, oh, yeah, I'm OK. And we just go back to society. It's obviously way more complicated than that. But it's just a different way of doing it. And, you know, what, 20 years later, like you said, Richard, you know, this is probably the better <laughs> Of the two approaches, I think. I mean, you know, I would agree. It's an attempt. You know, they, it, it, it's as described. These centers, the program blends classes on nonviolent interpretations of Sharia law with physical fitness, recreation, and counseling aimed at returning those who graduate to their families. As one staff member called it, undoing the quote, the brainwash that happens when a young man is drawn to religious extremism. Of the 137 men sent to Saudi Arabia from Guantanamo. Um, 116 have rejoined society and have stayed out of trouble. Mm-hmm. 12 were recaptured, eight were killed, and one is wanted, according to a program fact sheet. So it's not 100%, but it's significantly more constructive than what's going on in Guantanamo, as you said, and I agree. Yeah, and as you, as you, as you alluded to earlier, you know, this is a very complex political issue as well. I mean, it's a, a very lazy but easy way to look at this and say, oh, it's terrorist rehab, just like drugs and alcohol. And you just send terrorists or extremists to it. And it's basically a resort, you know, for them to. So so, so if you're looking for punishment, you know, it doesn't seem like the the right sort of reaction. And so, 
it's easy to criticize this and, and, and was a lot easier to criticize this back in 2006, 2007, when it was on 60 minutes and it received a lot of criticism, but yeah, I mean, this, this is, and I wonder Richard, and we don't know, but I wonder if this was discussed during the meeting between president Biden and King Salman, and crown prince Mohammed bin Salman. Interesting. I'd hope it was not. I'd hope they were on to bigger things. Not that this isn't big. You mentioned the 60 minutes is interesting because there was a, a jihad rehab, uh, jihad rehab, documentary film that was submitted to Sundance that was quite controversial earlier in the year. Uh, and actually, uh, you know, a couple of Sundance directors retired, uh, resigned as a result of it, just that they felt like it misrepresented and it also endangered some of the, 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 the men who were participating in the program mm-hmm. Either because they're old compatriots or whatever. But, but yeah, it, you know, it continues to be controversial, but again, it's, it's, you know, there's a reason why, you know, we're hoping Saudi Arabia might bail out because they actually have an ongoing program that addresses the problem. Mm-hmm. You know, just just keeping uh, folks locked up in Guantanamo forever doesn't doesn't do uh, doesn't address the problem. Are they still um, so? So uh, I guess a question is: Are they is, so they're trying to close down Guantanamo Bay, <clears throat> the detention center? They're not adding anybody to it. They, it. They're just figuring out how to get everybody out so they can actually shut the doors, pretty much, right? So this, yeah. Yeah, they've got, as I understand it, they have 39 detainees remaining, five of mm-hmm. whom are never going anywhere. Um, but, you know, a, a lot of those detainees, um, only two of those 39 have been convicted. Hmm. You know, so again, it's, 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 it's counter, as I said at the beginning, you know, a number of steps were taken in the post 9-11 period that were not consistent with uh, our, our best, uh, best habits. Uh, and maybe uh, there was, you know, emergency reasons to do this and maybe not, maybe, you know, cooler heads might have prevailed and taken a different path. But some of these choices have gotten us into problems. Some of these choices, uh, you know, we're dealing with 20 years later, like one of them. Um, a lighter fare. Uh, number, <laughs> number, I was just going to go on. <laughs> number five. Uh, Saudi crown prince leads a washing ceremony of Holy Kaaba in Mecca. Saudi Arabia's crown prince, Mohammed bin Salman, led the annual washing ceremony of the Holy Kaaba on behalf of Saudi King Salman bin Abdulaziz. The Saudi press agency reported the crown prince was accompanied by a number of dignitaries and carried out the ceremony, which is part of the tradition set by Prophet Muhammad after performing prayers. Yeah, this is a good story, Richard. Maintaining the Holy Kaaba is an important and delicate ritual, um, and cleaning is done based on longstanding traditions, which is it's just really cool to see this. Um, he was accompanied by Sports Minister Prince Abdelaziz bin Turkey, which was um, which is interesting. I, I know that they're close. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a good story. Great photos. Um, you know, I'm sure this made a lot of Saudis proud um, to see this. This is a good look. It's mm-hmm. important for heads of state to to, you know, be seen as, as, um, respectful of, of the, you know, the Islamic tradition and this, the holy sites. Mm-hmm. I thought it was interesting that the, the article provided a little bit of details on how it's done. I guess the walls of the floor of the Kaaba are cleaned differently. A white cloth soaked in rose and musk scents is used for cleaning the interior walls while the floors are washed using a mixture of Zamzam water and rose perfumes. Using your bare splat- hands and palm leaves. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Sorry, I cut you off. Sorry. No, no, sorry. The mixture is splashed on the floors that are cleaned with bare hands and palm leaves. Yep. Um, as, and, you know, presumably as the, the prophet himself did it. Mm-hmm. Yep. Richard, you and I both uh, sampled Zam Zam water at a conference a few years ago, which was an interesting um, little <laughs> addition to the to the flair, but that this is a cool story. Yeah. And we'll have some photos of this that were made available by the SPA, but uh, yeah, very cool. Yeah. Very cool. Um, yellow number six. six. Ooh, we're making progress here, Richard. Did we, is um, it six or did I, I jump, think it's did I six. Jump the shark? Yeah, it's six. You're right. Yep. Yeah. Yellow number six. I'm sure our listeners love having us lose count <laughs> after five. <laughs> we'll see you through yellow. <laughs> Back to Gitmo. Um, <laughs> um, yellow number I six. My one big thing, yeah. <laughs> Photos show progress made on Saudi Arabia's Red Sea project, and guests are expected in 2023, Richard. Images shared by the CEO of the Red Sea development, development company, TRSDC, John Pagano, show significant progress made on the Umhat Islands. <laughs> um, excuse me, the Umhat 
I'm a hot <laughs> island <laughs> reserve site. Um, it's funny because Richard, we were talking about this before the show and I called it a photo leak and you laughed and I was like, yeah, it's not a leak when the CEO <laughs> shares the photos. <laughs> um, we're putting it out on Twitter. <laughs> yeah. And he's like, Hey, check this out. We're making progress. Um, playing host of new Jama, part of a luxury hotel chains, Ritz Carlton reserve collection. The 82 key resort will welcome guests in 2023, according to Pagano. So uh, cool. <clears throat> This was a good choice. You added this. And I thought it was a good choice because we've talked about how some of these uh, giga projects are nearing uh, a, a place in their development where they can host people. And uh, same thing with uh, 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 Durian Gate. Uh, you know, it's coming along and it's getting close. And these pictures are really excellent. And uh, so I, I thought it was, that was a good choice. I, I would add, and we keep talking about this, how Saudi Arabia is now being... <clears throat> you know, mentioned in, 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 uh, the same breath as some unlikely other places. And so this property, the Ritz Carlton reserves worldwide, they have five properties. This will be the fifth. The other ones are in Thailand, Japan, Indonesia, Puerto Rico, Mexico. So, you know, they put this only in what they consider super elite, super interesting and intriguing sites. These photos are amazing. The YouTube viewers will see them. I mean, they've begun dredging. I mean, it's weird because it's like you see them and you're like, that's the that's looks like the rendering we saw two or three years yeah. ago when this was announced, but you're yeah. you're seeing it come together. They're dredging for sand to build some of these really cool um hotel rooms and keys that are on the water, sort of like Maldives style. Um yeah. but yeah, I mean they're making some serious progress here. This isn't pie in the sky stuff. And Richard, look at the watercolor. My gosh, it's like turquoise and, light blue it looks awesome you know, you know it's probably going to be even nicer because obviously there's been construction going on and there's been you know uh sand and dirt stirred up and stuff but yeah it's an interesting setting and it's it's going to be i guess so um as of march uh this is a, in part of that the article as of march more than 85 off-site manufactured beach and overwater villas have been fabricated and assemb assembled on site Combine these resort resorts will offer 172 hotel keys, according to the Red Sea Development Authority. Mm -hmm. um, this Red Sea destination, Red Sea Island destination, it's envisioned uh, upon completion in 2030 will deliver up to 8,000 hotel rooms across 22 islands and six inland sites. Just awesome. We cordially invite John Pagano to come join the 966 at a time of his convenience because uh, we'd love to talk with him about this stuff. There's so much going on. Um, this is really cool. I mean, this is definitely, you know, this is <laughs> this is progress. And just to add to your invitation to Mr. Pagano, we'd be glad to do it in one of the bungalows, overwater bungalows. Oh, sure. Yeah, we would be more than happy that's to more do convenient. that. It would be great if Richard and I could have separate bungalows, but if what is if we'll seal the deal, we just share a bungalow, that's fine. Um, yeah, I mean, the other thing, Richard, too, is I mentioned Ritz Carlton. These are major, you know, as we've discussed, major international hotel brands, you know, yes. so there's some there's some trust that you'll have when you visit a Marriott or a Ritz Carlton you know, in a new destination in a country you may never have been to before. So that's cool. That's a good point. You also get into their networks, you know, so, oh, if yeah. you're, you know, if you're yeah. a Marriott rewards member or whatever, you, you know, at some point you're going to get a, you're going to get a promo and a, an invite and advertisement for, uh, uh, you know, Omaha Islands Reserve. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Richard, like we just talked about with Dr. Saad, I mean, Saudi Arabia is looking for 70 million tourist visits this year after 62 million last year. And there was a huge boom for Saudi tourism that was domestic last year because of the pandemic and the inability to go anywhere else. So people started discovering their own country, which was really cool to hear him talk about, um, you know, because he's obviously been all over. So, um, yeah, this is really neat. Check out all these. If you're listening to this, check out our YouTube channel, because all of these images we're going to put on the YouTube video. It's cool to see this thing progress. Yeah, this was a good one because those, those pictures are interesting. Speaking of good one, Richard, this was a great episode. Um, uh, you know, it would have been perfect if you'd have just shared that 88 billion because I have to, in retrospect now, I have to reconsider the whole relationship. You're going to have to restructure all of your finances, by the way, because that 30 billion is going to go so quickly after you buy the Washington football team. I do have kids. Oh, wow. Yeah. Think of the things we could do. Yeah. Yep. Think of the things we could do. We could, um, well, that's a lot of money. Well, we could, yeah, we, we could do a yeah, lot. Okay. We could do a lot. We could, we would, we would not be issuing any, 
um, payouts to anybody that wasn't um, directly receiving a Lucid. So but again, um, would, you, you know, you're sort of taking us away from the point. You could do more with the 45, 44 billion I was willing to give to you than the 30 billion you were give to me. That's all I've got to say. I know, but your mistake was that you offered your number before I gave you my number. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I just had to disappoint you. Um, a negotiating flaw. A programming note, Richard, we will be, it's the um, August 18th, 19th when this publishes. We're going to be taking a little bit of time off at the end of the month. Um, we will still almost certainly have a weekly episode. Um, it may just be a modified format. We're still working on that. But if we go a little dark um, unexpectedly for our fans, we will be back. Um, we didn't disappear. We just haven't taken a break yet. And both of us are starting to visibly age. You can see the plant behind me. I'm killing slowly without water. So um, we, so just, it, just stay tuned. If we go dark for a week, it's just because we're taking a break. Um, but we'll let everybody know next week what our plan is. Absolutely. Another good one, Lucian. It's always a pleasure. It is always a pleasure. This is fun, Richard. See you next yes. week. See you next week. Cheers.